Well, Mr. Speaker, I rise uh, uh, tonight to deal with the problem that occurred in my recent uh, primary election, one in which, uh, let me say that I was successful despite this problem, but I want to bring it uh, to the attention of our nation uh, tonight. For while I mention it in reference to my own experience in the recent uh, primary election, I am convinced that it constitutes a danger for all America and threatens to rip the fabric of our uh, democracy. I am, I represent the second congressional district in Illinois. Uh, it is not a, an inner city district. It, is, consists, it consists mainly of bungalows, semi-professional and blue-collar workers, second and third generation families there. It is approximately 30% suburban, approximately 30% non-black. It is an industrial district that has housed most of the heavy industry in Illinois, automobile assembly plants, stamping plants, three steel mills, at one time four. And in this campaign, a strange thing occurred. A column was written by a columnist in the Sun-Times, Chicago Sun-Times newspaper by the name of Vernon Jarrett, that raised questions about who really was my opponent because of what appeared to be a strange tilt in the sources of his campaign funding. I want to share some facts with you here this evening that perhaps could be shared by some others who have been targeted apparently as I was in this primary and unfortunately lost their re-election bids. After seeing this column, I began to check the records and the, the uh, Federal Election Commission report of my opponent for this year, which was available only for January and February, of course, and began to check uh, the identities of those who had contributed uh, to his campaign. And I want to let you know what I found. It relates to an organization called the American Israel Political Affairs Committee. And so before I begin to give numbers, amounts, let me first familiarize you with the American Israel Political Affairs Committee because it is not well known beyond uh, Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. and your elected representatives. It is indeed a rather shadowy operation. And I want to not just try to describe the American Israel Political Affairs Committee, better known as APAC, and I'll refer to it as so, from the initials AIPAC, APAC. 
not to be confused incidentally with the term PAC referring to political action committees. That's a different kind of PAC. Political action committees, as you know, are those organizations under the Federal Election Commission that, uh, can tr that organize to contribute money uh, to campaigns for federal candidates and others. But APAC means the American Israel Political Affairs Committee, not a PAC. Have, has no right to contribute money to candidates, therefore. But rather than try to describe it myself, I want to just read excerpts to you uh, from newspaper reports that I discovered when I began to pursue this matter. And in the process began to realize that I had been targeted for defeat by APAC. First, the Wall Street Journal, June 24th, 1987. An article by John J. Falca, and reads just in part, referring to the Amer refers to the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or APAC, as one of Washington's most, most powerful lobbying organizations. And he points out in this article that according to a computer-aided analysis of 1986 Federal Election Commission reports, despite APAC's claims of non-involvement in political spending, no fewer than 51 pro-Israel PACs, most of which draw money from Jewish donors, I'm, I'm reading a quote from the Wall Street Journal, Jewish donors and operate under obscure sounding names are operated by APAC officials or people who hold seats on APAC's two major policy making bodies. Continuing this article, the analysis shows that three of seven regional chairpersons at APAC direct PACs, meaning political action committees now, those who can legally contribute money and do. Seven regional chair, three of seven regional chairpersons at APAC direct PACs, political action committees, and 26 more political action committee chairmen or treasurers sit on APAC's 131 member executive committee which meets four times a year and sets overall lobbying strategy. 22 more political action committee leaders hold seats on the second advisory body of APAC, the 200-member National Council. And it concludes that while the pro-Israel PACs, that's political action committees, not APAC, represent diverse and supposedly bipartisan Jewish communities, in almost every major city and region in the country, their spending patterns are remarkably similar. I have to ask you to bear with me as I read from three or four clippings briefly to lay the groundwork for you to understand uh, this obscure operation. Because however obscure and disguised, if you will bear with me, you will learn what should be of great concern to us all. The next clipping, and I'm going to relate these down the line, is from the Washington Times newspaper, January 13th, 1989. It says, in part, a group of prominent Americans concerned about Washington's diplomatic tilt toward Israel filed a complaint yesterday with the Federal Election Commission charging in a 100-page uh, complaint, charging that APAC has worked so closely, and I'm just reading, with legally established PACs to target political candidates on the basis of their positions toward Israel that the PACs, political action committees, are in effect affiliates of the lobby group. That would be illegal. That would be in violation of the federal election laws. 
would be in violation of what APAC contends are the limits of its own activities. And I continue this same clipping. APAC's formidable ability to mobilize congressional support is based not upon an, an appeal to American national interest. Now get this. Uh, but upon threats by a special interest that has resorted to conspiracy and conclusion. Unquote, that's a quote, says Richard Curtis, formerly the chief inspector of the U.S. Information Agency and one of the plaintiffs in this case. The complaint supported by more than two dozen exhibits, this is no longer a quote, this is the in the newspaper clipping, the report, demands that the FEC force APAC to register as a political action committee and disclose its activities. Such a ruling would hamper the effectiveness of the lobby, which operates behind the scenes to recruit support for Israel, the largest recipient of U.S. aid with $3 billion annually and to oppose weapons sales to Arab foes of the Jewish state. Now that's from the Washington Times by Isaiah Poole. Just a couple more, because I'll bet that most of you are not familiar with APAC nor any of this that I am reading. This is from the Washington Post, November 14, 1988, an article by Charles R. Babcock. It says, internal APAC documents made available to the Washington Post show that the group's top political operative was actively involved with pro-Israel political action committees, PACs, trying to help raise money for several candidates in the 1986 Senate races. A memo from Elizabeth Schreyer, then APAC's deputy political director, five weeks before that election, urged an assistant to call several pro-act Israel PACs and try to get $500 to $1,000 donations for five specific Senate candidates. In that memo, Shreya listed nine pro-Israel PACs and noted that some had not contributed to certain uh, candidates. Four other documents in 1985 Letters from Shreya to individuals in Massachusetts, California, and in Hawaii. In them, she offers to provide fundraising ideas and arrange speakers for new pro-Israel PACs, sends a sample solicitation letter and a list of pro-Israel PACs to a fundraiser for her candidate, and volunteers to answer questions about how to start a PAC. A PAC's major goal, says this article from the Washington Post, is maintaining, is maintaining the level of foreign aid to Israel, now $3 billion a year, and defeating arms sales to Arab countries. Now, what it's beginning to show you is that the interest, the purpose of APAC is to promote a foreign nation, not America's interest. An organization operating within America composed of Americans in the interest of a foreign nation, interfering in the internal affairs and the elections of this nation. Let me show you, let me go just a little, go a little further now. Here's again from the Washington Post, October 7th, 1988. Let's see what kinds of interference, for what purpose, and who do they attack? Let's watch this. This article written by the same Charles Babcock, it says this, now listen closely. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee, the nation's chief pro-Israel lobby, has become a subject of attention twice in the past week because of reports of partisan involvement or personal attacks in the 1988 political campaign. One case centers on a year-old internal APAC staff memo urging that Jewish reporters, and I'm reading from this article, this is not Gus Savage saying this, 
1K centers on a year-old internal APAC staff memo urging that Jewish reporters raise questions about Jesse L. Jackson's sex life and finances. APAC, pursuing the interests of a foreign government, beginning to try to develop surreptitious means of hurting, damaging a presidential candidate in this nation. This gets closer and closer, as you would notice, to something un-American. Now, here in a, a special report, the, the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs, July 1989, it points out here, and I'm reading again, 70 active pro-Israel political action committees, are those the PACs that can give money to influence elections, outcome elections, spent $3,870,000 in direct contributions in the 1988 elections. And I'm skipping over just reading excerpts. There are several factors that make these pro-Israel PACs unique. The first is their name. Now, you might ask, what's in a name? Then if there's nothing in a name, why try to name something in a way as to not reveal its purpose and its function? It continues in this article, Edward Roeder, whose Sunshine News Service publishes Pax Americana, that's a book, to draw this admission from Robert Golder, president of Delaware Valley Pax. From Robert Gold, the president of Delaware Valley Pack. Now that's an innocently sounding name, Delaware Valley Pack. That could be about nature. Could be about the streams or whatever else might attract people to the small state of Delaware. Could be about the, the headquarters of the many corporations that are located there. But what does Gold, the president of the Delaware Valley Pack, say? Quote from this article. Quote, this pack is a group of American Jewish people working for a stronger American position on Israel. I don't know that it is necessary for outsiders to know who we are. It's a small group of Jewish fundraisers raising money from mostly Jewish contributors, and we can explain who we are to them, unquote. Robert Golder, president of the Delaware Valley Pact. The article now, I'm no longer quoting Golder, but the article by Richard Curtis continues that if 70 pro-Israel PACs active in 1988 coordinated their giving, and to do that through APAC would be illegal, coordinated their giving, internal APAC documents instructing employees to contact named PACs and tell them to give designated amounts to named candidates, which have fallen in the hands of both the Washington Post and the TV show 60 Minutes. You may recall uh, the show when Mike Wallace exposed APAC. They indicate that coordination involving at least 20 of the major pro Israel PACs took place in 1988, and that such coordination makes APAC and those PACs into a single PAC, circumventing the law that limits donations to a single candidate. Now, let's, after I've got through after I've described APAC to you, made you a bit more familiar with APAC. Now let me go back to where we started and relate it to my recent primary. Here's a letter dated February 20, 1990 from a Robert H. Asher, 211 East Chicago Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Now I'm going to tell you who, and I'll identify for you this Robert H. Asher later. Let me first read this letter that was mailed by Robert H. Asher. Well, let me just tell you right now so I won't hold you in suspense. Robert H. Asher was the president of APAC. The letter reads, Gus Savage has one of the worst attendance records in Congress. Well, now, of course, that's untrue. The records of how, you, how, how often you vote in Congress is a matter of public records in print. And though many of you may 
know that in newspapers and television for the past eight, nine years, whenever hardly, I mean, many times when they just mention my name, they'll say Gus Savage who has such a poor attendance record. And if I say that it's in print, then they can find out just what that record is, and find out just what that record is, and find out that, and they would discover that record was not poor, except for the few months of bereavement when I, in 1981, lost my wife of 34 years to a a very excruciating ailment. Then except for that, nowhere near poor. But yet he says this. And as I said, that you can just, I'll explain later why it might be interesting to note that the press has been saying this for the past eight or nine years, knowing that it was not true, and knowing that you would have perhaps no interest enough to check to find out whether it was true or not and just accepted it. And he says that since he is consistently anti-Israel, Gus Savage, anti-Semitic, pro-PLO, pro-Farrakhan, his lack of attendance is probably a good thing. That's a bit scandalous, but let's see what was his purpose of, of uh, disseminating such falsehoods. If Savage is not defeated this time, he'll be in Congress as long as he wants. Well, I hope he was correct in that regard at least. Then he concludes, please send your check payable to the committee to elect Mel Reynolds in the enclosed envelope. The primary is less than a month away. Sincerely, Robert H. Asher. Wonder why he's so interested in APAC in influencing the outcome of a primary election in the second district of Chicago. The main issue in the second district in Chicago is not Israel. It's about jobs. These unemployed steel workers, unemployed automobile workers, jobs, working conditions, wage rates, federal assistance to avoid mortgage foreclosures as a consequence of unemployment resulting from the structural economic changes in our country, not Israel. Why then would he be so concerned about the outcome of that election? Let's see just how concerned he actually is. Now what I'm going to do is where I really wanted, the point I wanted to reach that makes this all relevant. I have here a list of the executive board of APAC. The executive board of APAC and its national council and officers. That's how I know who Robert Asher is. What I intend to do here now is to take the Federal Election Commission report filed by my then opponent Mel Reynolds filed here his signature for January and February of this year, the only one now, the latest one that is, that's available. Now, I'm making this statement because I want you to conclude or agree with me that we need to strengthen the federal election laws we need to enforce that which now exists against APAC. And we need to be concerned about an agency whose main concern is the interest of a foreign government taking advantage, taking advantage of the rights and privileges of American citizenship to influence your Congress. Now, Reynolds had to file this, as all candidates do. And incidentally, let me say, when I go to point out to you how much money he raised, you will find during that period, though they say incumbency is protected by our capacity to raise so much money, in that period, I only raised $15,000. But Reynolds raised $51,000, more than three times as much. Never held office before in his life. Didn't live in the district until a couple years ago. What about all of this money? 
Well, I can tell you something about money. I was uh, doing our break in January. I took a little time off. I play golf. At least I claim I do. Some of those who play with me deny that. But at least I try and I enjoy it. Find it relaxing. So there is a great golf course down in the Bahamas called Paradise Island. So I went to Nassau to play golf. And after you finish a round of golf, you go back to the hotel resort, as some of you have done, I hope, and you go outside because it's such a wonderful uh, climate there. And there's outside the bar of refreshment stand, maybe a better way of putting it. And you go out and you refresh yourself and they have entertainment outdoors there by the bar. And in this instance, there's Calypso singing, very common in this part of the world. And the fellow was singing a song, a Calypso song. I had not heard it before, but I do remember the lyrics because they were so interesting. And they are applicable here. You know, Calypso is like the blues to African Americans. It's often they are complaining about personal problems. And in this song, that's what he was complaining about. That according to the lyrics of this song now, this man was complaining about his woman. Not uncharacteristic of Calypso songs, nor of the blues. Apparently she had come home very late one night. In fact, she had stayed out, she had stayed out all night long. And as they say, the sunshine had caught up with her. She said, the song says, in the case that she came in, fell asleep, the man so concerned and distraught, very poverty-stricken family, started checking to see was she all right. And he noticed her purse, which is, was usually bare, was just chucked full of something, just bulging, a bulging purse. And he opened the, pulse, the purse, rather, and money just fell out. All kinds of money, he said. And that's what the song says. All kinds of money from all kinds of places. But of course, in, the, in, the, in a resort like Nassau, people come from all over the world. And as the song goes, he tried to awake her, to ask her, where did you get all of this money? That's the title of the song. And it goes. Where did you get, I can't sing, uh, unfortunately. Some people say I don't speak too well either, but uh, let me just talk it. It says, where did you get this money? American money. German money. Japanese money. Jewish money. Where did you get all of this money? That was the question I asked myself when I saw that my opponent had raised so much more money than did I. Where did he get all of that money? Well, fortunately, the FEC report, in the FEC report, it requires that anyone who gives you $200 or more, an individual, must be listed by name and address. And any PAC, that's a political action committee, that gives you money must also be listed by name and address and the name of his treasurer shown. All right. I was a journalist before I was ever elected to office, journalist for some 20 years, an award-winning journalist, learned a lot about how to do research, and, but of course it was not hard to research this. So I took this list and I looked at his individual contributors. Let me give you these figures. Just bear with me, if you please. Now, of that amount that he had raised, 8,250 of it was itemized as individual contributions, meaning from people who gave him $200 or more. Of the 8,250, let's see how much came from where. And to do that, I refer back to this list from APAC, now blown up so you can see. 
list of its executive committee and national council and officers. We want to see how many of people who contributed this money, the large sums, also on the executive committee of the national council or, one, or as an officer of APAC. Called cross-checking, you know. And now let's just go down and let's see. First of all, the contributor is that same Robert Asher. Now, you know, the most an individual can give to a candidate is $1,000. The most that a PAC can give to a candidate, however, is $5,000. Private corporations cannot give money. Unions cannot give money out of union funds. Now, let's just check it. Robert Asher, as I told you, is the president of APAC. His address is 51 Oakmont Road, Highland Park, Illinois. That's not in the second district, not even in Chicago. But he's interested in the second district to the tune of $1,000. Let me just read this list. Mary Jane Asher, $1,000, Highland Park, Illinois. Daniel Asher, $1,000, Highland Park, Illinois. Howard David Sterling, Beverly Hills, California, $250. Louis A. Morgan, $500, Highland Park, Illinois. Susan Asher, $1,000, Highland Park, Illinois. And on and on, I won't read all to you. But I took these names, the Asher, Robert Adler, $500, Robert Adler, Louis Morgan, Urban Wine, $500, took all those names and found that they were all on the executive committee of APAC. Not living in Chicago, let alone in the second congressional district, but board members of APAC who were not supposed to try to finance campaigns. Not legally, can it? Has not the legal authority. And when I added it all up, as you can, if you like to check these, because everything I've mentioned here is available to you. The APAC list, the, the, the uh, uh, FEC report of my opponent, all this is available to you. I added it up. And it showed that of the $8,250 from individual contributors, itemized amount of uh, uh, contributors, 6,750 were from these. In other words, 82%. I'm not saying that he got a few contributors who liked APAC or loved Israel or, or, or to give him some money. Nothing unusual or odd about that, but not 82% of all of those contributions for people affiliated with APAC, one organization, not in the second district. Primary purpose, concerned about the interests of a foreign nation. Now, from PAC, political action committees. People organized to give money to campaigns. He received from those $20,500. So I wanted to check to see what PACs. Well, you have, again, all of this is easy if you know your research, and I'm hoping you follow me so you can practice some of this yourself. It's surprising what you can learn sometime, just a little time. The Almanac of Federal PACs, published right here in Washington. This is a reference book. List all the PACs and their officers. But more than that, it groups them by purpose. If you have a good label record, such as I do, you'd want to naturally, naturally want to solicit funds from the labor unions. So they'll list all the labor unions, and you go and solicit your money. It also groups them by whether they are pro-Israel or not. Almanac of Federal PACs, 1990. Let's see here. 
says the emergence of a network of pro-Israel PACs as an important source of campaign funds for federal candidates has become an issue of intense controversy even among American Jews who want to promote Israel's security but don't want to be perceived as being driven by a single issue. I didn't say that, that's what this book says. There was little doubt that con contribution decisions are centralized either through a formal or informal arrangement and then it proceeds to list these pro-Israel pacts. It says it is well documented that many of the pro-Israel pacts were created with APAC's encouragement. APAC, despite its name, is not a PAC, but a lobbying organization. Under federal election law, PACs are deemed to be affiliated if they are established, directed, or controlled by a common organization, or if they have the same officers, vendors, or contributors. Then it lists these pro-Israel PACs affiliated with APAC. So I took this list, you see, and compared it to his list of PAC contributors, the total of which he, from which he received $20,500. Let's see how much of that $20,500 came from these pro-Israel PACs affiliated with APAC, APAC, of which most of you have never heard, but influences who represents you in this August body. Now let's go and let's take a look. PAC. $5,000 to Reynolds for Congress from the Joint Action Committee PAC. Joint Action Committee PAC listed right here. Let me get your, your list here. Wait, that's my stuff. Listed right here. Joint Action Committee PAC, Highland, Illinois, affiliated with APAC, pro Israel PAC, according to this almanac, I mean, this, this reference work, rather, that that I did not write. Washington PAC, $1,000 to Reynolds for Congress, Morris Amate, Treasurer, Washington, D.C. In this list, multi-issue PAC, $1,000, Highland Park, Illinois. In this list, Citizens Organization PAC, $5,000, Los Angeles, California, in this list. Ain't got to the second district yet, you notice. Listen to these names. Nothing says anything pro-Israel in these names. Obscure names. Why? Citizens Organization Pact. Los Angeles, California, $5,000. Hudson Valley Pact. Spring Valley, New York. Interesting, the second district? Spring Valley, New York. No steel mills up there. $1,500, Reynolds for Congress, Americans for Good Government, $1,000, Jasper, Alabama, in this list. East Midwood PAC, $250, Garden State PAC, Union, New Jersey, $1,000, in this list. Desert Caucus PAC, Tucson, Arizona, $1,500, in this list. Heartland PAC, Cleveland, Ohio, $2,500, in this list. What does it all mean? It means of the $20,500 that he received uh, from PACs, $19,750 came from PACs with obscure name, affiliated with APAC, an organization whose main concern is the interest of Israel not America. Be that interest good or bad, right or wrong, but a foreign government, that amounts to 96% of all his receipts from tax. That means practically all of that money in that purse, or his purse, practically all came indirectly from APAC. More than nine of every ten dollars of the money for one to challenge me in the second district of Illinois, where Israel's interests are far from being primary. 
Now, let me say something about my position regarding Israel. May explain the concern, but certainly doesn't justify a body with no legal right to do so, whose primary concern is a foreign nation rather than the interests of America, trying to determine the outcome of an American election for Congress. That, my friends, Mr. and Mrs. America, is dangerous indeed. Israel receives almost one-third of all of the United States foreign assistance. Three billion dollars in the foreign assistance bill and usually four or five hundred million dollars more tacked on here and there. Roughly three and a half billion dollars a year. That's not the government's money, that's your money. Your tax dollars. We don't have enough money to maintain full funding for student grants and student loans for those in need to attend the colleges of their choice for which they are qualified. Not enough money to create jobs programs for those pockets of poverty in our nation. Not enough funds for long-term Medicare for our senior citizens in need. But three and a half billion dollars of your tax dollars to one little nation, Israel. A nation with only about three and a half million citizens. That means then that you are giving $1,000 a year to every man, woman, and child citizen of Israel. Think about that. Now, since I am particularly concerned about the welfare of the third world, since it is the poorest part of our earth, one that on which we are dependent and benefit greatly, this nation, uh, will, will benefit greatly from the natural resources of the, of the 45 sub-Saharan African nations. Now, while Israel only have three and a half million citizens roughly, there are some 350 million citizens in the 45 sub-Saharan African nations. How much do we give them out of our foreign aid? $550 million only, which comes to, compared to the $1,000 per Israeli, $1.57. Our resources from there, but our money goes to Israel. Seems to me we should drop some of the pollen where we get the honey. Even bees know that. My position is that that is upside down. We should give the larger amount to the larger group of people who are in greater need and from whom we benefit most materially in Africa. Give the 3.5 billion to Africa, let the 550 million go to Israel. But more than that, 1.8 billion of that 3.5 billion is for war, military aid. Well, my God, military aid to Israel, a, a nation that holds in prison presently some 9,000 Palestinians, unfairly, unjustly, many without charges. Military aid to a nation that in the past three years has killed unarmed, defenseless, 650 men, women, and children of Palestine. Why not better take that military aid and take it over to Zambia in Africa? Give it to the African National Congress so that they can be sufficiently armed to chase off the face of the earth the last remaining vestige of fascism, the apartheid regime of South Africa. 
That's my position. Now, someone said, well, Gus, you receive money from PACs, almost always labor PACs, but PACs, organized labor unions. So the checks often come out of Washington, D.C. That's not the second district. Why isn't that the same? It's not the same because American trade, union, trade unions do not represent the interests of a foreign power. They rep the, represent the interests of American workers. That's an American interest. And some 40,000 citizens of the second district of Illinois are members of trade unions. Because I said to you, that's an industrial district. And PAC contributions, while maybe from Washington, come on the recommendation and request of their local affiliates. United Automobile Workers give you a contribution from here, but it's because of this recommendation from its Region 4 back in my district. So it has a right to be involved, and its interests are not un American. It's not putting the interests of another nation above its own. No comparison, indeed. And now, as I made before concluding, point out this connection between this interest, this insidious interest, and mass media in this country. You may think you know something about mass media because you're exposed to it so in television. But really, it's uh, in many ways as obscure and mysterious as APAC. Ask yourself, who owns CBS? Who is the president of ABC? Who are the board members of NBC? Where does Tom Brokaw live? You know where I live? You know what is my salary? You know my marital status? You know where I went to school? You know my views? You know my children's names? You know Tom Brokaw far better than you know Gus Savage or you think you do. Is he married? What is his salary? What are his views? For all you know, he may be one of those running around with a hood, burning crosses, because you don't know. Powerful man controls your airwaves, determines whether Gus Savage can go on the air or not, determine what is said about Gus Savage, good or bad, right or wrong, true or false, unaccountable to you. You can't fire him. You can't unelect him. You did not pick him. I want to say something about the campaign coverage because it was rather strange. May not be coordinated by APAC, but the apparent influence of a network of reporters across this country and the major daily newspapers and the television stations operating in the same way, telling the same lies simultaneously, makes one wonder. My campaign, Chicago Tribune, that's a major daily newspaper, largest circulation in Chicago, has a Pulitzer Prize columnist named Mike Royko. Wrote, wrote a column during this campaign strongly condemning me, and falsely so. Said in the column that I had phoned him and told him that what appears to be my concerns are really false. I'm not really concerned about civil rights and racism and so forth in America, so I just use that to help stir people up. And he said when I told him that on the phone that he felt this and then he told me what he said to me and what I said back and what he said and so. But the problem is I've never talked to Mike Royko in my life by phone or otherwise. In other words, he made up the column. When I protested to the editor of the Chicago Tribune said, look, I never talked to this guy in my life. How could he write this falsehood? Would you ask him to retract it or, exp or explain it or prove it? Never. Never a reply. 
unaccountable. The political editor of the Chicago Sun-Times, same thing, Steve Neal, same thing, called me all kinds of names. I've never met him, never talked with him. Then you have, and I don't want to say that the only uh, well, people who may be a part of such a network would be these columnists. Generally, the white press would have at least one uh, uh, so-called parent African-American columnist to jump on an African-American too if in case the African-American hollers too loud and says, well, these columnists jumping on me is white, so you got a, a page in the Chicago Tribune, a raspberry in the Washington Post, and oh, no, that's typical. Same kind of columns. I was on Crossfire on CNN. Some of you may have seen it and you saw what a time Robert Novak gave me. I'm sure if you saw it, you could see it wasn't fair. How much does he earn? Where is he married? Does he attend church? Has he ever been a member of the Ku Klux Klan? I'm not saying that he is. I'm not saying that he's married. What is his sexual preferences? I don't know none of that. All I'm saying is we don't know anything about these powerful bosses. Or spokesmen, or talking heads on television and columnists in the most powerful newspapers of our land. And democracy depends upon a free and fair press. I held a hearing to try to save the Economic Development Administration that the president is asked to be eliminated. The other hearing in Pennsylvania, the coal mining area, where because anthracite coal has such high sulfur content, people are have unemployment, suffering unemployment in double digits. They held it in Chicago because their African American community suffer, suffers unemployment in the double digits. Have not uh, enjoyed the prosperity that other parts of the country has, or that the prosperity that this country in general has uh, enjoyed in the past eight, nine years. We need economic development projects in such areas, went into Chicago to hold one such hearing, trying to stir up interest in saving EDA, and the press would not even cover it, not in Chicago. I'll tell you, I've been treated better by the press in Johannesburg, South Africa, than in Chicago, Illinois. I sponsored the biggest set aside in the history of this country, an amendment to the 1986 Defense Authorization Act. That could mean some $8 billion a year to minority, disadvantaged minority-owned businesses. Very proud of that. It's the largest set aside than all others combined. During this campaign, Channel 2 in Chicago, the CBS affiliate, reporter named Mike Fannery, insisted right there on television that Gus Savage did not sponsor that legislation. And I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll give you a congressional record. I'll get it to you tomorrow. Would you... If, 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 if you're wrong, would you go on your news show tomorrow and admit that you were wrong? And of course, if I'm wrong, go on there and point that out too. I sent him the congressional record showing, of course, that he was wrong. He never used it, never another word, unaccountable, nothing I can do. I'm the sponsor, I'm the sponsor of legislation for a third federal building in Chicago, a project costing $153 million in employing some 50,000 people in the construction trades and the spin-off job that will result from that. $45 million of that amount in subcontracts to small disadvantaged businesses. On that same television interview show, he insisted that uh, I didn't do that either. Easy to ascertain whether I did or not. You got a congressional record. Reporters are certainly familiar with it. It meant that that was a deliberate deceit. Well, that kind of effort to disinform the electorate is also a danger to our democracy and to the extent that it relates to activities such as the ones I've described from APAC, it makes you wonder, are these connected up, in which case the danger would be even enhanced? Look at the strange attacks across this land on African-American leaders. 
Oh, well, that one was found guilty and that one was found guilty. I don't mean whether they were guilty or innocent, but the, the intensity and the frequency with which they are pursued. Finally, let me say that I hope I've given you enough information already to cause you some concern. We operate uh, in, a, in an atmosphere today that is not favorable to civil rights and racial equality. You might call it high-tech racism kind of racism that would cause a movie like Driving Miss Daisy to be named the best movie of the year. Driving Miss Daisy. Because maybe there are those in America who would like to turn back race relations to the old days where blacks did do the driving and Miss Daisy rode in the back. Those days, my friends, are gone forever. Some of us may have to drive Miss Daisy, but we don't love it. It doesn't make a very good movie, for it's insulting to too large a segment of the American population at a time of high-tech racism, driving Miss Daisy. Wonder how my American Jewish friends would feel if there was a movie about during the Holocaust where some Jewish man who was compelled because of imprisonment or whatever the reasons under the Holocaust to be a chambermaid for some Nazi general and the movie was about how much he enjoyed that which of course would not have been true any more than Driving Miss Daisy how much he enjoyed that and that movie received an Academy Award. Wonder how they would feel. Well, that's just how African Americans in the main also feel. We are losing an understanding of each other or when we need to understand each other more than ever because America is losing its competitiveness in world trade. It's become a debtor rather than a creditor nation. And part of the reason is worsening race relations where the number of male blacks in college is going, falling down, the number in prison going up. Unemployment has remained at double digits for the past 10 years. More than 50% of black children live in single parent families. The black family being destroyed to the disadvantage not just of blacks but of all America. When we have a nation that operates in such a way, this high-tech racism, that when a black becomes Miss America, that the first thing that black feels is necessary to say is that being black is the very least that I am. If you were Irish, Swedish, Jewish, you happened to win Miss America, how would you feel if the Irish victor got up and said, the least thing I am is Irish? Or well, the Jewish victor said, the least thing I am is Jewish. Why does she feel such compulsion? It's because she's trying to survive in this high-tech racist society. And so they create an image of me, a myth that's no more accurate, no more real than Heathcliff Huxtable. You know, in the South, I understand after World War II, and I'll tell you this a little bit and I'll be through. In the South, in World War II, they said that a black veteran, back then in the South, often lynch mobs would come after blacks. So a lynch mob came after this black veteran and he still had his M1. And he was a sharpshooter. Shot down 17 of the mob before they got him. And guess what? 
You would think they had taken him out and lynched him twice. But you know they didn't. Didn't even arrest him. Didn't put him in jail. Instead, they put him in the insane asylum, asylum.